Hello, everyone, and welcome to the live interaction with National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants. Today's program is Exploring Coral Spawning in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. We will begin promptly at 2 p.m. Eastern, so stay tuned until then. Hello everyone and welcome to the live interaction with Exploring by the Sea Pants and NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Today we will be exploring coral spawning in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Sea Pants to give you a bit of a rundown on how this live interaction is going to work. All right, thanks so much, Hannah, and so great to see everybody who started to join us live today. Uh, as Hannah mentioned, my name is Joe Gorowski, and I want to welcome everybody to today's uh, live interaction with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So before we do, I want to share my screen just briefly to introduce you to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So uh, we bring science, adventure, exploration, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and around the world through virtual speakers and field trips. Uh, during these different times right now, with schools being closed, we're broadcasting all our events live into the homes of parents, educators, uh, and students everywhere. So if you visit exploringbytheseat.com, uh, you can find our website. As you scroll down, the most important spot, spot to sign up for the newsletter, uh, and we send out updates each week with the events we have coming up, and a few cool events to highlight coming up this week. A lot of ocean action with uh, World Ocean Day coming up next week, so uh, we've got an event about the lost warship of the Baltic Sea. We've got uh, piranha feeding at Ripley's Aquarium of Canada. We're gonna spend a little bit of time celebrating Environment Week. Uh, so we'll be talking about air pollution, uh, contaminants in indigenous communities, as well uh, as monarch migration. We'll even be on Thursday heading to the Duke Lemur Center to check out the lemurs that live uh, in the forest. So lots going on. One more thing I wanna share with you before we continue with the event. All of our events are interactive. We have polls and quizzes that go on throughout these events. And here's a little bit of instruction for how to join them. So we use Slido, really easy to find online. It's just sli.do. We'll bring you to Slido, and then it'll ask for an event code. And today's code is CORAL. So if you head over there, you'll find there's a survey already open and ready. I have a direct link posted here, but I'm also gonna post it in the chat section uh, of the go to webinar in just a moment and if you're quick and you have your cell phone handy you could also scan this qr code i have here in the corner and that will take you directly there as well so i'm gonna leave this open for another couple seconds um, so please head over there because the questions are going to start soon there'll be an interactive quiz as well uh, towards the end of today's event so i'm going to come back from that screen share now there we go that should bring me back and today we are going to take a virtual field trip to the depths of Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary with expedition lead Dr. Sarah Davies of Boston University. Before we do that, I'm going to throw things back to Hannah McDonald, Education Specialist with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, who's going to take us on a little tour. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. 
we are going to, like Joe said, take a tour. And I also wanted to introduce Dr. Sarah Davies from Boston University, who was the lead scientist doing coral spawning research in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. We'll learn more about Flower Garden Banks and the coral spawning from Sarah, but first, we are going to explore the National Marine Sanctuary System. So the National Marine Sanctuary System encompasses 14 National Marine Sanctuaries in two marine protected areas. That totals in 600,000 square miles of marine waters protected by this system. In a few minutes, we're gonna go through a virtual tour, seeing photographs from each of the sanctuary sites, but they cover things from kelp forests in California to coral reefs in the Florida Keys, to even freshwater sites that protect shipwrecks. But we do wanna make sure that this is an engaging interaction. So first Slido question of the day is, are you watching this live stream with other people? If so, how many? Now, if you're tuning in just now and weren't able to get the Slido information from Joe's, Joe's slide, the link is in the chat, so you can click directly there. Um, Joe, how are we doing? What's our turnout in Slido? All right, so we have people finding the room pretty quickly. Uh, let's take a look at the results coming in first. A lot of, well, we've got a nice mixture here. Some solos, some three, five, sixes. Someone hanging out with their cat again. I wonder if it's the same person from last time. Uh, <laughs> so lots of people finding the Slido room. That is great. All right. And moving on, we have another question. So before the virtual tour, have you ever heard of NOAA's National Marine Sanctuaries before? All right, 81% of our respondents, over 50 in the room so far, have heard um, of the sanctuaries before. That is great news, awesome. And it just keeps increasing as we keep doing these interactions. So I hope a lot of these people are tuning in again. All right, so as I said, we're gonna go on a virtual tour of the sanctuary system. We're gonna start in the most northwest corner of the continental United States in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary where they have incredible tide pools and deep sea corals. Moving further south, there's Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary in Northern California. In this photo, you'll see elephant seals on the beach. Bordering Greater Fairlands is Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, also in California, known for protecting deep sea corals like you see here. Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is also in Northern California and protects abundant biodiversity and is an incredible spot for key research findings like this brooding octopus garden. Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary is the last sanctuary in California and is about 25 miles off the coast of Santa Barbara, California, protecting kelp forests and providing biodiversity for uh, species like this lobster here. Going further west into the Pacific, we have Papaanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument, which is the largest marine conservation area in the world. We have Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the breeding grounds for humpback whales. There's also the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, which protects Big Mama, the longest living known coral head. Coming back to continental United States, 100 miles off the coast of Galveston, Texas, and where we'll be learning a lot more about today is Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Going down off the, off the coast of Florida, we have Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, protecting the Florida Keys Reef Track. Coming a little bit north, we have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, protecting a live uh, bottom reef ecosystem off of Georgia. And our very first National Marine Sanctuary was Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of North Carolina. This sanctuary protects the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck. Our newest National Marine Sanctuary is Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary, which happens to be in between Maryland and Virginia. As you can see from this photograph, this is quite a unique sanctuary because the shipwrecks are partially submerged under the water. 
In Massachusetts Bay, we have Stowagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, known for incredible whale watching. And then in the Great Lakes, in Lake Huron, we have Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, which protects over 200 shipwrecks. So now that I did that virtual tour, I want to know if you've ever visited a National Marine Sanctuary before. And if you are just joining or new to this event, the Slido link or the way to answer these questions is found in the chat. All right, even more in the room and we have 65% have visited a National Marine Sanctuary. That's great. I encourage the other part of you to find the one that's closest to you and visit it when you can. They're beautiful places. So before turning it over to Dr. Davies, I want to talk about what the National Marine Sanctuary system does. So we protect sea giants like the humpback whales in Monterey Bay, to the small sea life of Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, including corals and reef fish. We are protecting places with abundant biodiversity, and we're providing shelter to some of the most charismatic marine species, like this Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtle. We are protecting places with great maritime heritage, like Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and we're mandated to do resource protection to keep these places around for generations to come. We're also mandated to do education and outreach, which allows us to connect with you today to talk about our National Marine Sanctuary system. These are very special marine places, and they're ours. They're ours to paddle, ours to fish, ours to snorkel, ours to boat, and ours to surf. These are our places to recreate in. So these are our, also our places to do research in. So to give you a little bit of background on the project that Sarah will be talking to you about next, I'm gonna tell you about the Telepresence Exploration Award that was given to three grantees, the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration being one of them. So NOAA awarded funds for telepresence exploration. Now telepresence means bringing the ship to shore. Now that can be for a scientific audience or for the general public's audience. So this cruise that Sarah is about to tell you about was broadcasted in real time so that viewers across the country could partake and see what they were seeing on the seafloor. I was able to partake, especially watching Sarah's expedition and see coral spawn in real time. Very cool way to do ocean exploration. This partnership was done with the National Marine Sanctuaries and NOAA and Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration did their research in 2019 in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. And with that, I am going to turn it over to the expedition lead, Sarah, Dr. Sarah Davies. So Sarah, I am going to switch over to having you share your screen. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, and if you wanna turn on your webcam, that would be awesome. Great. Let's see. And we are seeing your slides. Cool. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to put this here. Okay. So I'm Dr. Sarah Davies. Um, if any of you are Twitter savvy, I'm fairly active. And you, this is my Twitter handle here. Um, I post all sorts of fun things and maybe some not so fun things when it comes to some of the coral health. Um, but I'm an assistant professor at Boston University. Um, you might be able to see me, but just in case you can't, this is what I look like, and I'm holding actually a coral piece from the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary um, that was collected in, actually this one was collected in 2018. Um, I've got a little Canadian flag there because I am I hail from Canada. <clears throat> I first started working at the National at the Flower Garden Banks um, when I was doing my master's at the University of Calgary. So this is this crazy thing we set up at 80 feet in a sand patch on the east bank of the Flower Garden Banks, and it was looking at um, recruiting corals, so getting baby corals to grow on tiles and um, testing different types of animals living in these different bins. Um, in, I then went on and did my PhD work at the University of Texas at Austin, so slightly closer to Flower Garden Banks. This is me diving um, back in 2010. And then I also continued working at the Flower Garden Banks as a postdoc at the University of uh, North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, specifically working on a die-off event that happened there. And, and then I got 
uh, uh, lucky enough uh, to collaborate with the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration as an assistant professor here at BU, um, looking at um, mesophotic coral spawning. So it's been an exciting exploration. So just to remind you where we're going, we're going here to the Flower Garden Banks. Um, so this is a place that's very close to my heart and I hope to continue working here forever. It is one of the coolest places I've ever scuba dove and I've dove a lot of places around the world. <clears throat> so this is, a, this is where the Flower Garden Banks are. So um, it's about 100 miles south of the Texas-Louisiana border. So if you can see my cursor here, um, right along the border here, it has uh, three banks, the Stetson. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but we have the West and the East Flower Garden Banks. And we generally go out on the RV Manta, which is this beautiful boat pictured here out of Galveston, Texas. Um, so Flower Garden Banks is really amazing. I know this is about coral spawning, but I'd like to highlight a little bit um, of the charismatic megafauna that we have. Uh, so this is a sea turtle, um, some great fishes, manta rays. This is my first and actually only whale shark I've ever seen was at Flower Garden Banks. Uh, they have the invasive lionfish um, there now and they do um, active extractions with local fishermen. Um, and I think what's really great about the Flower Garden Banks for me as a coral scientist is that the coral cover at Flower Garden Banks, which is in this orange color here, you can see through time. So this is going from 1989, probably before many of you were even born. Um, survey data show that the percent coral cover, so how much coral is actually on the reef, hasn't really changed through time. This is really interesting. So we're sitting at about 50% coral cover. This is specifically at the East Bank, but the West Bank is very similar. Um, and this is in contrast to what's happening globally, where we see that uh, this is going from 1970 to 2010. Um, this was work done in the Caribbean in blue, and then this is global work done in the black color. And you can see that the percent coral cover back in the 70s and 80s was around 50% but now we're looking at very low percentages of mean coral cover. Um, so coral reefs worldwide are being degraded um, and this is why Flower Garden Banks is such a special place because here we are at 50% today. Um, so this is an example of a coral from the Flower Garden Banks. They grow massive in size and they're absolutely beautiful. But I wanna tell you a little bit about what is a coral reef. So we see these corals and they look kind of like rocks but they also kind of look like plants, but they're actually rocks, plants, and animals. So this is zooming in on a coral and we call these polyps. So they look kind of like anemones. So if you remember like Finding Nemo's home was an anemone and corals are related to anemones. Um, and then, so this whole colony is covered in these tiny little polyps that go out <clears throat> and they feed off of plankton in the water column. And they also have this brown stuff in them. And that's why we say that corals are also plants, because they have these photosynthetic algae. These are single-celled algae that live within the coral tissue, as you can see in this close-up photo. And they photosynthesize and provide the coral with its food. So, um, so that's why they're able to live in waters that are really clear. Um, so when we go snorkeling on coral reefs, we see that the water is always really clear, and that's because the corals are able to photosynthesize uh, by using light to get their food. So a little bit, oops, that animation's broken, but um, a little bit about specifically the type of coral I'm interested in are called broadcast spawning corals and they have a really cool life cycle. So once a year, this is such a crazy phenomena, they, they release their um, eggs and sperm into the water column. So corals only reproduce once a year. Um, it's timed by the warmest month of the year um, then the day is eight days after the full moon in the warmest month. And then um, each species goes a certain time after sunset. So they release these bundles of eggs and sperm. These go to the surface and create these spawn slicks. And this is where fertilization happens. So this is where the eggs and sperm will come together and make these cute little larvae. And you may think that's not very cute, but I'm gonna show you this little gif. Look how cute they are. Um, so they swim around um, once they receive cues emanating from the reef so they can smell the reef through different sensory mechanisms. And so this little guy here is smelling, looking around for a good spot. And then this is another um, coral. Now we call them, this is when they settle. And so now they're stuck to the reef. Um, and then this final one here, this image that showed up when it shouldn't have, is a picture of a coral recruit. And now you can see it's got these anemone arms and these red dots are those algae. 
Um, so this is the coral broadcast spawning life cycle. So when we think about corals moving between reefs, it's really only the larval stage that's able to do that. Um, so this broadcast spawning behavior is really important when we think about how connected reefs are to each other, because the only way a coral can get to another reef is if they release these, um, these larvae. So this video is broken. So I think we have a quick question break while I pull up the video. So I will. We do, we do. So while you pull that video up, Sarah, uh, we've got a quiz loaded up in the Slido. So I'm going to give people a few moments just to pop their name into the quiz and we'll see how well they've been paying attention so far. So we have two questions like this during the video transitions. And there was one other survey question that was open just before we shifted over. And that was um, wondering how many square miles the National Marine Sanctuaries encompass and 76% went with 600,000 uh, square miles. So good job uh, to those who are tuning in. I see the that quiz is numbers correct, climbing. 600,000. I see the quiz numbers climbing. I'm going to give another second just to get a few more uh, in, and then I'm going to start the quiz. So the quiz, each question has 20 seconds on the clock. The quicker you answer it, the more points you get. And of course, if it's correct, that's pretty beneficial as well. So here we go, I've got over 50 in the quiz, so I'm gonna start it now. That first question's up, what is the coral, what is the coral cover of the flower garden banks? So is it 30%, 50%, 60%, uh, or 10%? You've got about 10 more seconds uh, to lock in your answer for that question, and then we'll let Sarah go ahead with her video. All right, 81% went with 50%. What do you say to that, Sarah? Woohoo! Good job, people. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you this um, amazing video. This wasn't taken on our cruise, but I think it's one of the most spectacular videos of coral spawning that I have access to. Um, so I'm gonna play it. So this um, is a species of coral that actually has males and females. So what we just saw before that was the males, and these are the females that are releasing their eggs. Um, so this is the first species, its name is Montastera cavernosa, um, and this is the first species that we see um, spawning the night of coral spawning. So like I said, it's one night um, a year, and then this one here is um, Orbicella franksii, and you can see that wave that just happened across the screen, and this species is one that has bundles of eggs and sperm. So these, you can see, they're really floaty, so you're gonna, we're going to pan out here, and you're going to see that all of these gamete bundles are kind of rising up in the in the water column and it's and so this coral is at about uh, 70 feet deep um, so these gametes need to move all the way to the surface in order to find a um, meat to fertilize with so it's um it's really important um this broadcast spawning behavior so um some of the research that we've done at the flower garden banks um, on a couple different species of corals um, has shown that um, so here we have the flower garden banks down here, and we've shown that it depends on how long the larvae actually spend in the water column, but um, sometimes they release babies and they come back to the reef. So they, that's, we call that self-seeding. So that's where the coral releases the baby, the baby swims around in the water column, and little eddies will take the coral back to the flower garden bank. So they'll live on the same reefs as their parents. <clears throat> Other species whose larvae live in the water column much longer, we've shown through simulation, or that's just like nerdy talk for um, using our computers to predict where the larvae go, um, we see that a lot of these larvae actually make it over here to the Florida Keys, which is another national marine sanctuary um, that our lab also researches at. Um, and we've shown that there's actually connectivity um, both through simulations and through um, using genetics to say that these two national marine sanctuaries are actually connected. So this is some of the like really interesting work we've done at the flower gardens. Um, so what about mesophotic corals? So this is a picture from the flower garden banks. Um, so this is looking at where we normally would dive. So this is the sand patch. You can see it's usually about 80 feet deep. So this is a beautiful picture of a manta ray. Um, and you can see that clear water column allowing the sun to get down to the corals to photosynthesize. Um, so this is where we normally dive. Um, and diving, you can imagine, at 80 feet deep um, is quite challenging. Um, 
if, if anyone on the call has uh, any diving experience, you'll know that um, you need special um, requirements to be able to dive so deep. Um, and you can't stay down for very long. So we're limited with scuba techniques on how long we can stay down here. So this is looking at the East Flower Garden Banks. So you'll notice, so the sand patch up here, so this is in meters. So that sand patch is about this 18 meters here. So this is really just the reef cap. So it's really just the top of the reef. And we have no, we don't have a lot of idea about what's going on with the reef below that. Um, so there, but there are reefs. So there's, and there's differences in these reefs. So the shallow reefs, we call shallow reefs are generally zero to 30 meters. Um, then there's mesophotic reefs, which are the reefs that we were focused on, and those are 30 to 200 meters. And then there's deep reefs, um, which are below 200 meters. So we're really focused in our lab on shallow reefs and mesophotic reefs where corals grow. And there's lots of interesting differences in the water, um, the quality of the environment that these corals are living in. So corals that are more shallow will get more light and they'll also have higher temperatures and more water flow. But the corals that are deeper, while it's darker and generally cooler temperatures and lower water flow, they also get more nutrients. So the water in the deeper parts is definitely more nutrient rich. So there's lots of differences about mesophotic reefs. So we can't really dive down there, or at least um, with, without very intense training. Um, so how can we monitor corals down at these mesophotic reefs? And the answer is collaborate with people from the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration and use the RV Yogi, uh, which is, or sorry, the ROV Yogi. So that's the remotely operated vehicle. So that means we put this vehicle in the water and we're able in real time to see what's happening um, down below on the surface. So it's a much safer way to explore the depths of the flower garden banks. So this is the manta um, at the surface. We're not underwater, but this little red track is where RV yoga, Yogi had gone. And you can see, so we're deeper. So this is the 40 meter transect here. So we're actually really deep here. We're probably about 55 meters um, and we're able to explore um, in real time what's happening on these reefs that are deeper. So um, our exploration in 2019 had three legs. Um, so our lab did leg two, the coral spawning, but there was also two other legs that there are presentations I think you can also view. One of them was exploring coral reef biodiversity and connectivity, and that was the Voss lab, and I believe um, Josh Voss will be presenting on June 3rd. And then there was the Brugler lab that did the black corals, which are really deep. They're in those really deep reefs, um, and that's on June 5th. So um, you can try to explore those other uh, legs of the um, the Global Foundation of Ocean Exploration as well. So this was our research team. So we have um, Hannah Eichelman, who's a PhD student in my lab, Emma Hickerson, who works at the National Marine Sanctuaries and has been like a colleague forever with me. Um, Dr. Marie Strader was actually our lead on the cruise and you may wonder where I was. Um, I'll tell you in a second. So. Marie Strader is now at Auburn University. Lauren Howe Kerr is a graduate student at um, Rice University. And then Brooke Benson, she used to be a lab manager in my lab and now she's a, a doctoral student at UC Davis. And I was actually not on the boat. This is me tuning in live with my little baby. So yes, the, um, the real being having the telepresence cruise was amazing for many reasons, but it was also amazing for me because I could lead my team um, from shore because my baby was a couple months old. Um, so we had a couple of goals in 2019 that we wanted to, um, that we were hoping to reach. So one, our question was, when do deeper corals spawn? Our second question was, um, or our second goal was to actually collect adult fragments from the mesophotic reef and keep them alive on board and actually bring them back to Boston University. And the third was to collect bundles of eggs and sperm using Yogi, so using the special apparatus that they developed for us. Um, so what did we observe? So the really cool thing that we first observed were these crazy, we call them CCA fields, which stands for crustose coralline algae, and it just went for as far as the eye could see. If we zoom in, it's beautiful, this pink color. If you zoom in, that's what it looked like. So this was crazy. I'd, I'd literally never seen anything like it before. It was totally insane. Um, and I think there's plans to go back there. Um, we observed lots of sharks and fish. There's a lionfish, squirrelfish, um, shark, charismatic megafauna, uh, another squirrel fish, um, angelfish, a pair, they usually occur in pairs, 
Um, and then we also found lots of corals. You can see the coral cover here. So this is all coral. Pretty much like everything you can see is a coral. Um, just plates and plates of these beautiful corals. Um, we also saw some fire coral. Um, so this one here is actually bleached. So we did observe some bleaching. Bleaching is when the coral loses its algal symbiont. Um, and then here we can see another lionfish. Um, and then this is just a beautiful um, coral. All right. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to transition to the second um, video if you wanted to ask the other question. All right, sounds good. So those who have left the slider room, if you want to pop back in, I'll give you a couple seconds. We'll ask part two uh, of the quiz and then we'll see who comes out on top. So a couple more seconds and then I'll pop up the next question. All right, here we go. So the next question, how deep can a mesophotic reef be? Was it 10 meters, 50 meters, 100 meters, or was 200 meters the max depth for one of these reefs? We've got about 10 more seconds to get your answer in. I see lots of answers coming in. A couple more seconds. All right. 49% went with 200, oh, just shifted 47% went with 200 meters, um, which was the correct answer. So if we check the leaderboard really quickly, we've got Natalie in first place, two for two in 10 seconds. Um, Melise in second, two out of two in 12 seconds, and then Becky, two out of two in 15 seconds. So good job, everybody, and thanks for playing in the slider room today. Sweet, okay, so um, I'm gonna show you some um, footage from our, um, just some highlight reel of the coral spawning we did do. Um, so th this is deep, this is at about uh, probably 45 meters. Um, so it's zooming around, so now we can see a male. So that's that cloudy stuff you see coming off. This is a better footage, so you can see these are males releasing uh, sperm into the water column. And one of the things you'll see is that the sperm's really moving away, and that's because we had a lot of current. Um, this is the ROV yogi trying to collect those gamete bundles, but you can see that it was pretty, um, you can think of it as windy down there, and there was also a lot of plankton. Um, and this is us collecting the adult coral pieces um, from the colonies, and I'll show you pictures of what they look like today in the lab. Um, so we put them into these buckets, and then we bring them to the surface and keep them alive. Um, and um, this is collecting a second um, piece. So you can see this is a slightly bigger piece. And this is these guys back in the lab um, and they are very happy. I'll show you some pictures. These are some more updated photos of what they look like shortly. Um, but we did a lot of exploring um, under at these mesophotic reefs. Here's a lionfish, um, but that was the highlight of the spawning reel. And you may be wondering why we saw so little spawning. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what we did. So we did observe, um, we did observe coral spawning. Um, and when did they spawn? They generally spawned at the same time as the shallower corals that we normally observe every year. Um, we also, as you saw in the video, we were able to do real live coral collections um, using the ROV. So we were able to, I was able to um, call in and tell them what species we were working with. And then we'd find a good little overhang and we were able to collect the coral. So here's a zoom in of that claw that's collecting the um, pieces of coral. And this is what we kept them in on the deck, very uh, savvy bins from Home Depot. Um, keep them in the shade so they're not sun stressed. Um, and this is what they look like. We kept them at Moody Garden overnight, um, which was great. Uh, we're really grateful to Moody Garden for <clears throat> housing our corals for us. Um, and then this is what they look like back in the lab. Um, so we put them onto pucks that are labeled um, so we can tell where they came from. Um, and what I have photoed here is actually this really interesting behavior we've learned about these mesophotic corals. So you see this kind of slimy business coming off of this coral. Um, when we feed the mesophotic corals, they don't put their tentacles out. You can see the ones in the background. There are more shallow corals from flower garden banks. They have their tentacles out and they're feeding. Um, and these guys put out these weird slime mucus 
nets and that's how they collect their food. So it's just this really interesting um, behavioral difference between the corals that live in the shallow and the corals that live in the mesophotic. So I'd say that our adult um, fragment collection um, was very successful. We had 100% survival back in the lab at Boston. Um, we tried to collect coral spawn. This is the apparatus that the engineers at the Global Foundation for Ocean Exploration designed and I think if we'd had normal conditions or at least happy conditions in the water, I think it would have worked really well. Um, so this is us trying to collect the coral spawn. Um, unfortunately, um, there was a ton of um, plankton. So that's like little critters in the in the water column. And they created these really crazy vortices above the corals and, um, and then they, so they were contaminating all of our spawn because they were, the lights of the um, ROV were really attracting the spawn or the, the plankton. So they were definitely, we had a lot of contamination. So this is the team trying to individually pipette out um, little uh, lar coral larvae um, through all hours of the night trying to find the larvae. Um, using all sorts of neat ways of seeing what is a coral and what is not a coral. So I'd say that this was sort of a success, um, but not really. Um, so when we think about some of the cruise issues, this is the type of picture you want to take out in the Gulf of Mexico. It's beautiful, it's flat, it's sunny, and sometimes you get weather like this. So we were dealing with weather more like this, which makes um, running the ROV very challenging for the, the ROV drivers. So they did an amazing job, but it, there was a lot of current underwater um, and it was a very challenging trip. Um, these, these plankton vortices definitely were, were an issue um, that uh, allowed us to maybe collect fewer uh, coral babies than we were hoping to. But I'd say overall the cruise was a success. Um, these are the corals again back in the lab. So you can see these. Um, so this one here is with its pop, like the, you can see it's really tentacly. That's what the shallow corals look like. So they have their tentacles out when they're feeding. And these are all the mesophotic ones. They have very thin tissue and they just put out this big slime. So they kind of slime the water to get their food. So, um, and this is what we're working on back in the lab. We're doing a bunch of um, thermal tolerance tests and stuff. So um, it's been really fun having them in the lab. Um, so with that, I thought I would open it up for questions. All right. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was a great presentation. Looks like an absolutely amazing place to dive. Uh, and really good news to hear about all the success uh, that came out of it. Very cool. Thanks. So to those tuning in, it's now time for some questions. I can take questions from two spots. I'll be looking for questions that come in the, in the sidebar. Uh, of the GoToWebinar, but also the Slido page does have a spot for questions. You can even upvote other people's questions to the top uh, if it's one that you were thinking about. So we can get kind of the top questions from there uh, as well. So let's dive into some of those questions. And uh, let's see what comes up first. Okay, so the first question I have here is about uh, bleaching events due to ocean warming. So is this uh, becoming more uh, or less severe compared to other locations you've looked at? At Flower Gardens there are bleaching episodes but they're they're quite short um, and we don't seem to see a lot of colony mortality. So one thing to note to the to the audience is that coral bleaching is when the coral loses its symbiotic algae <clears throat> and it doesn't mean that it dies but I showed you all the pictures of the coral feeding. Um, and so corals can receive food input, not just from their algae, but they're also feeding off plankton. So when they lose their algae, they definitely lose the major player for their nutrition. Um, so they, they're kind of starving like on a really severe diet, but they don't die right away. They slowly starve to death. Um, so normally at flower gardens, what we see with bleaching is they'll bleach, so they'll show that white phoenix, that white coloration, um, but we often see that they recover. So the corals can actually, they don't lose all their algae and they're able to recover with background amounts of the algae that live still in their tissue, um, and then they repopulate the tentacles and then they look the brown color again. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why Flower Garden Banks is really special. Um, it's probably to do with that it's deeper and further offshore and has lots of things that buffer it from us humans doing things to the reef, um, much, which is much different than what we're seeing on in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, where the reefs are really close to shore, they're much shallower, and we're seeing a lot of bleaching and a lot of disease at those reefs. So 
Um, I think it's one of the reasons why the flower gardens are really special. So yes, we see bleaching, but we don't normally see that the corals are dying from that bleaching. Okay, so Michelle is wondering about uh, when the coral spawn. What are some, are there some signs you look for, time of the year, what do you, how do you know it's time? Yeah, so this is a great question. And uh, Emma Hickerson and I go back and forth every year and I always just trust her because she just always gets right. Um, it's So you have to count when the full moon was and then you have to count eight days after the full moon. But what happens when that full moon occurs at like a weird time of day, like 11 p.m.? Like does the coral count that as night one? Or does the coral count like yesterday is night one? So there's definitely, it's not perfect. Um, and then also in a really warm year um, or when the or when the full moon occurs at kind of a weird time, we can get split spawning. So that means that the spawn is kind of split across two months. So when I say it's like, oh yeah, we can predict it within minutes. It's like, if we're, if we're lucky that year, but it is fairly predictable, um, but things we're looking for. Um, so like I said, it's the warmest month. So it's usually in August. And it's eight days after the full moon. If you're good at counting where the full moon is, it's difficult to know what corals think. Um, but then when we're underwater, um, well, first of all, when you're above water, you can kind of smell it. Um, any coral spawning person knows the smell of the coral spawn. It has a very unique smell. So that usually tells you, I smell something and I think the corals are spawning. And then we look in the water and we can see things starting to gather on the surface. And that usually tells us that it's getting close to time to jump in the water. Um, and then underwater, what you look for is the corals have like their tentacles and then they kind of hold. They start looking really bulbous, uh, but they don't open their tentacles. Normally at night, corals have their tentacles and they're feeding off the plankton. But during the coral spawning night, they're like this and they're kind of poofy. They look like, I call them juicy. They look like they're chocked full of stuff and they are. And then they, and then you start seeing the circle at the mouth and that's the gamete bundle. And then eventually, all of a sudden, just like the whole colony releases everything. It's crazy. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of the things we look for long-term and then what we're looking for in the short-term. So when we're looking underwater, when we're actually diving, we kind of scan with our flashlights and look for um, things that are releasing or when we can see them in the mouth. So that's what we're looking for. All right, so we've got Anna, and Anna's curious about when the ROV takes a sample, uh, from the coral, does how long does it take to recover? Does it affect the the colony much? Yes, yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, so we never went back to those colonies, so I can't say um, for sure what happened to those specific colonies. Um, but what we see um, again and again is if you're sampling from a healthy coral. Um, so I've done lots of sampling of corals, ranging from stuff like that where you take like a whole fragment. Um, to um, we actually do like coral coring like you would a tree core so we actually use a big drill and take out the entire center of a coral and then put a cement plug back in and then we can take that whole core and then we can look at how quickly the tissue <clears throat> grows over that hole and we've monitored that at three different um, reefs so we've actively had to monitor the rate at which the coral recovers um, so this was work done in the Florida National Marines sanctuary or Florida Keys sorry um, Panama and Belize and in in every case after two years the coral had over had covered up everything you couldn't tell which corals we'd cored anymore um, and then when you're taking smaller samples um, it covers up like within a couple months the tissue just kind of like grows together <clears throat> with these fragments um, so I've never actually looked at long term, but my my guess would be based on how other injuries work with corals is that we take if we take kind of the piece like this, and I'm I'm guessing that it would just uh, the tissue would grow over that um, piece that we injured, and then it would slowly grow like a normal um, edge. But taking from the edge is I think probably better than taking from like the center of a colony like we do for other types of sampling. So my feeling is that I hope we didn't hurt them too bad, but I think they're okay. All right, so in the Slido room, the question vote at the top is from Asher, and they're wondering about your favorite marine species in the National Marine Sanctuary. <laughs> I hate being such a, like a cop out, but I have to say the whale shark. It was by far the coolest thing I've ever seen. And it's such a nerd, it's such like, a, it's not nerdy. I should pick like something nerdy, like my favorite coral species, but I mean, it was such a cool experience. It was this juvenile male and I like, 
never swim in the water without a rash guard um because i'm like scared of getting burnt and also like the jellies and stuff so i always and we we de-skinned after <clears throat> a dive and then someone's like there's a whale shark i literally just like popped myself in the water and like chased it for like an hour it was i didn't chase it i watched it um <clears throat> but it was just such a such an amazing experience to be and he was so curious like kept coming back so i mean that's definitely the highlight of my time at flower gardens although most of my work there is on coral so i should have probably picked a coral but it's going to be the whale shark all right uh let's grab another question here this is from anonymous but they're wondering if all uh corals are hermaphroditic no, so that's a really great question. Um, so there's actually like lots of different types of reproduction strategies in corals. So the ones I work on are the broadcast spawning ones. Those are the ones that spawn once a year. Um, and within broadcast spawning corals, you can do one of two things. You can have coral colonies that have different sexes. So they have males and females. So you saw the video footage of the coral that was releasing kind of like, it looked like smoke. Those are males and that's the sperm. And then the females kind of release these um, kind of toothpaste eggs. Um, so some species are, they, they call that gon gonochristic, so they have separate sexes. Um, but the grand majority of broadcast bonding corals are hermaphroditic. Um, and then there's other types of corals that are called brooders. And they do lo like lots of complicated strategies. They um, suck in sperm from their environment and like fertilize their eggs and then release larvae that are actually ready to settle. Um, so it's a very different reproductive strategy. Our lab doesn't really um, work on those corals. We mostly focus on broadcast spawning species, but they're not all hermaphroditic. Okay. So Susan's wondering if any of the coral you collected or if there's future plans to try and use uh, collected coral to kind of uh, give a little boost to parts of the reef that might be struggling. So that is such an awesome question too. Um, no, only because we would probably not get permits to do that. Um, so I'm part of the Coral Restoration Consortium. Um, I'm um, one of the scientists on the genetics working group. So there's a group of us that are looking at um, viable options, <clears throat> to, especially in the Florida Keys where the coral, coral declines are quite severe. And we're having to start to ask questions about how to best um, do restoration on a local level, and then also how to do restoration on a more broad scale, like across the Caribbean. Um, so these are definitely, we don't have answers, I don't think, but um, we wouldn't get permits right now to ever move corals from the Flower Garden Banks to the Florida Keys. Um, and so there's no plans for that. And the reason for that is like many reasons, we don't know what would happen. So corals also have a huge consortium of bacteria that live on them, just like us. So we have like, you've heard of our like gut microbiome, Corals have the same thing, but um, it's throughout their whole tissue. So they have a bunch of microbes, and it could be that flower garden microbes are really great at flower gardens, but maybe if we put them onto Florida reefs, they could do really bad things. Um, so right now, there's no talk of that. I do think there, we are trying to get approval right now of um, nursery babies in Florida that are from different places like Puerto Rico. Um, we're, we're hoping that eventually it might be approved that we're able to outplant um, some of the species that are in more severe declines, not the species we work on. Um, but yeah, so I think it's a really great question and I don't think scientists have all of the answers, um, but we're working on it. And, um, but yeah, for now, they're just like our pets in the lab that we've been keeping happy during COVID. All right. So Vinicius is wondering about the coral in flower garden banks, wondering if it's, uh, more thermal tolerant to the bleaching episodes or is it protected by the depth? That is such an awesome question. That's something that we were planning to test this summer. Um, so originally we'd planned on, so we have, I told you we have like two types of corals in the lab right now. We've got the shallow corals from flower garden banks, like more shallow, like they're from the 18 meter area. And then we've got the ones that were collected quite a bit deeper in the mesophotic. And our original goal was to test differences in thermal tolerance for the corals um, due to a variety of issues. So we couldn't do the experiment in the fall because the mesophotic corals weren't very happy because we didn't know how to feed them properly. And now I told you that we know about this like weird mucusy business that they do. Um, so um, then we planned on doing it in the spring, right after spring break, and spring break at BU was when we closed down for COVID. Um, so that experiment is, it's a great idea and we 
we, we are doing it and hopefully um, maybe next year I could present what we find um, with those. But that's a great question. And our, and our, our hypothesis is that the shallow water corals um, are better able to deal with heat stress and also light stress than the mesophoto corals. Um, but yeah, we haven't tested it yet. All right. So we have a different Susan who's wondering about the coral spawning event. So obviously you're in the water, you're collecting some samples. She's wondering what other creatures are taking advantage and feeding on the coral spawn. Yeah, so lots of things are, um, <clears throat> well, just in general, when you're night diving, um, lots of things are following you and eating all sorts of things. And you feel like a little bit like a murderer because you're sitting there with your light and it feels like, a, oh, I see a cool fish. Like, look at that cute baby fish. All of a sudden, like this giant fish comes and eats it. Um, and with the coral spawning, we've seen lots of different things eating the spawn, but definitely like there's crabs that eat them. There's fish that eat them. Um, but no one specializes, I don't think, on coral spawning. Oh, there's sea stars that eat them. Um, but no one specializes on coral spawning because it wouldn't make sense because then you would only get a meal once a year. Um, but lots of things will, will eat spawn. Um, so it's definitely one of the things we think is the primary source of mortality of larvae in the water column is just baby fish, crabs, all sorts of things in the plankton eating it. <clears throat> Yeah, so and then not necessarily flower gardens, but um, in other areas of the world, you'll see like um, the coral spawning happens at the same time as like whale migration in some areas. And you'll see like they they like so a baleen whale just come in and just like scoop up all the spawn or like a whale shark comes in and just like eats everything. Um, but again, it's not like they specialize in coral spawn eating. That wouldn't be very smart, but they definitely think it's tasty. All right, we're going to wrap up with a final question. A uh, few are asking the same question uh, about what uh, drew you to your field that you work in. And I want to add one little part to that because Lane added a little part to hers and she really wants to know what the smell is like. What is the smell <laughs> of spawn and coral like? Um, so what drew me to uh, work on coral spawning was, um, so I grew up landlocked in Canada, but I was working at a marine station for the summer and this a uh, guy named John Levitan came and talked about coral spawning. And I just like, couldn't believe that such a, it was totally coral spawning that brought me into coral research. Because I couldn't believe that corals were so smart because I just thought they were rocks. Like, how do they do this? And we still don't really know. Like, how do they cue it so carefully? And it's such, it's such an example of like perfection in nature. Um, so it was definitely the coral spawning that drew me into being a coral biologist and scuba diving um, and flower garden banks definitely helped. Um, and then what does it smell like? I don't know, like kind of melons. I should text Emma. Um, you should, you should actually, um, if you, if anyone's on Twitter, you should tweet at me what does coral spawning smell like. And I feel like a lot of coral spawning people will have really good descriptions, but it's definitely kind of like a fruity, weird smell. And like my PhD advisor ate some on toast because he, he thinks that he's a big believer in that you need to eat what you research at least once. And it was filthy, like it was disgusting. So it's definitely not tasty. Um, but it has an interesting smell that I, I, I associate as being like a really nice smell, but I've had new graduate students tell me that it smells really gross. So I can't really describe the smell though. All right, fair enough. We appreciate uh, you trying and maybe some people will shoot some answers at you or some, some more questions at you via Twitter. So we do want to start off with a big thank you to everybody in today's event. Thank you for all the great questions. Uh, coming through the question bar. Thank you to all those who joined in on Slido and played along and sent in your questions there. Uh, obviously, Sarah, huge thank you to you for a great presentation. And I'm going to throw things back to Hannah to wrap us up for today. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Dr. Sarah Davies. That was a fantastic presentation. And I do have to say one of the most memorable moments of all of 2019's expeditions for me was watching what Emma explained as the coral spawning tornado that happened live. I think I was laying in bed, it was maybe 11 Eastern time, stayed up late to watch coral spawning and it was fantastic. So your work is incredible and I just wanted to thank you for sharing with all of us too. Yeah, thanks for listening. So I also wanted to update all of the attendees that all of our live interactions with Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants are located on a playlist within his YouTube channel, Exploring by the Sea of Your Pants. So you'll be able to find this live interaction as well as all of our previous live interactions there. 
give us a few days to get this recorded recording down um, up on the page. But once it's there, feel free to rewatch any parts that you were really interesting to you or find a interaction in a different National Marine Sanctuary about exploration. Upcoming, like Sarah said, we have two more webinars this week, both in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, talking about different aspects of this expedition. So tomorrow we are going to be with Dr. Joshua Voss, and he will be talking to us about coral reef restoration or coral reef biodiversity. And then on Friday, we're going to be talking with Dr. Mercer Brugler about the black corals in Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. So you will not want to miss learning more about Flower Garden Banks this coming week with our live interactions with Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants. And then we have another very exciting live interaction coming up next week with Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants to kick off World Ocean Week and the launch of our Sanctuary's 360 media collection. So we will be launching four 360 videos on Monday, June 8th for World Ocean Day, but we're gonna be going over them with you and you get to meet the videographer on June 10th at 11 a.m. So feel free to sign up for that one too. Many exciting live interactions coming up. And for even more, you can find them on sanctuaries.noaa.gov slash live. We host two different types of live interactions. The ones that we're hosting with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants geared for students. And we also have a webinar series geared for educators to teach them about how to bring marine conservation and science into the classroom. Also wanted to highlight all of Joe's programs, which bring scientists and explorers to your screens through Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Great ways to connect. And then NOAA Ocean Today also hosts a webinar a month to bring NOAA Ocean Science to you. Following this program, you'll see a link to do a survey. This survey helps us assess these programs and build them out moving forward from figuring out what topic areas you're interested in to seeing how we can improve the format. So we really appreciate your feedback if you are an adult and able to fill out the survey. So with that, that is all that I have to share on behalf of NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. I wanna thank Joe from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and Sarah from Boston University for presenting such incredible work on Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary. Thanks. And with that, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone.